everyone and welcome to our live stream. I believe this is our first live stream of 2021. Wow, we made it. Look at that. <laughs> I am Marie Walker and I am the director of the Ada May Ivester Education Center here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. And it is my absolute joy to welcome you back for 2021. We have so many wonderful programs planned, so many new and exciting things that we're doing. One of those new and exciting things is our monthly donation goal, which you will see below me on the screen right here. So um, we are doing a donation goal for the month of January. We love doing these free live stream programs, but we also do need money to continue to support our mission. So if you have been enjoying these and can spare a, a few dollars or maybe many dollars, uh, please go ahead and you can donate at the link that you see right there. So without further ado, we are going to be talking about Louisa May Alcott, her life and her work. She is primarily known for her writing Little Women, but she wrote so much more and she did a whole, whole lot, had an incredibly interesting family, and we are all going to talk about all of that today. So Louisa May Alcott was born on November 29th of 1832, and she lived until March 6th, 1888. She is most well known as an American novelist. She was also a nurse during the American Civil War, which we'll talk about in a moment. And she, she did a variety of things to help her family make money because her family would be uh, on the poor end of the spectrum and their, their daughters had to work in order to make money. I mean, she's primarily known um, for being a novelist and that is the profession that she really excelled in. She was raised in primarily New England. The family moved around a whole, whole lot. Um, they were transcendentalists, which is very close to the Unitarian Church movement, but uh, they're, they're kind of uh, two offshoots. They're not exactly the same. But uh, transcendentalists, they believed um, more uh, about, about thinking about things. It was an intellectual movement as well as a spiritual movement and there were a lot of very famous people who they were friends with who were also transcendentalists like Henry David Thoreau who wrote on Walden Pond um, and, and many others that they were they were really in that group there in New England that uh, there, there were a lot of big thinkers and writers and their family was part of this movement and Louisa May Alcott was also a part of this movement. She was indeed a, a writer, even though she didn't necessarily write, um, she's not well known for writing transcendentalist work, uh, but she was definitely raised in that movement. And a lot of those beliefs can be seen throughout different parts of her writing. She was also a tomboy growing up. She was a tomboy. She uh, very much like Joe in Little Women, she very much thought, oh, it would be nice to be a man and to do whatever I wanted and to not be restricted by society as being a woman in that time. Uh, she was, she liked to play outdoors. She liked to, you know, be, be a little bit more rough than what a refined lady was supposed to be. So hospital sketches. Louisa May Alcott served as a nurse in a union hospital in Georgetown, DC for about six weeks. Uh, she, after that time, she contracted typhoid and became deathly ill and had to be sent back home to recover. Very much like in Little Women, her, uh, the father in Little Women, uh, Mr. March, ends up getting sick after he uh, is fighting for the Union Army, he gets sick, and then Mrs. March, their mother, has to go and be with him. Now that is, this is why Little Women is considered to be semi-autobiographical because that did indeed happen to the family, but it was not the father who got ill. It was Louisa May Alcott who got ill while, while serving the Union Army. From this experience, she wrote and published the work called Hospital Sketches, which were very much based upon her letters home and her accounts and her observations from working in this Union Hospital. And it's really her first critical recognition for her observations and her humor. So that's how she starts to get, get famous, is from hospital sketches. That's where her first acclaim comes from. The family primarily lived 
in Orchard House. That's what you consider the Louisa May Alcott house. It's a museum today. It looks lovely. I would love to visit sometime. But the family, they moved 22 times in 30 years, which is just so much. It, they, they moved around a lot because uh, they, they were poor and a lot of times it was someone who was offering them a place to stay. At one point they tried to go to a transcendentalist utopia community that did not work out well. They stayed there for about two years. Uh, so after all of that, they moved into Orchard House in 1857 and that's where they they primarily stayed uh, for, for, for a while. Uh, a lot longer than they stayed a lot of other places. And Orchard House is located in Concord, Massachusetts, very much um, in the New England sphere in which Louisa May Alcott was, was writing. Uh, they moved into this house right before the American Civil War as American politics were slowly degrading um, into sectional fights over whether slavery should be allowed to continue to expand to new territories or if it should be limited, if it should be done with in a way with altogether. Uh, very heated and a very uh, troubled political time for the country. But that's when they have then when they're settling in the backdrop of uh, when they're settling into Orchard House. The house was actually built in the 1690s. So if you look, this is this is where architecture historian Marie comes out. If you look at this house, you will notice it has a gable in the front. It has gable on the sides. It has a center chimney that has nice arches. So what I would consider a segmented chimney, perhaps. Uh, I can't see inside the arches, but I would assume that it is indeed a segmented chimney. Uh, but sometimes segmented chimneys they have their own little uh, spoots, but this one has its own separate arches. This is very much a New England type of house. It's very much, it's just a box. And then it has a gables on the side with a center chimney. If you go down south, you'll notice that chimneys are usually on the sides of the house. Sometimes people just think, there's, there all, there's always a variety of reasons about why people do, do things. But one of which is, this is just a way in New England that people built houses. People from New England, they, generally came from more of the south of, of England. And then in the south, you have a lot of English, Scots, Irish immigrants. So they have different building traditions, but also in New England, it is far colder than it is in the south. So you want to contain the heat in your house, hence the center chimney versus chimneys on the sides in the south where it gets very hot, especially in the summer. And it doesn't ever get that cold. So you want to have their chimneys on the outside so the heat disperses quicker. Uh, this is a, I, I can tell just by looking at this, this is a center hall plan with two rooms on either side. And it has five windows across um, on the top, which means it is more probably of English design. You'll, if you go up into the Pennsylvania, um, the mid colonies area, you'll see a lot of German uh, type construction, which looks very similar, but it usually only has four windows. And Orchard House is the setting for Little Women. And in, in Little Women, it's set during the American Civil War in the 1860s. So this house, which has been standing since the 1690s, it's still standing to this day, which I think is just, for America, that's really old, a really old colonial house. Uh, but Lucy May Alcott was indeed living in this house during the American Civil War, very much just like the characters in Little Women. So employment. Um, a lot of girls during this time did not work outside the home, but the Alcotts, because of their economic situation, had to be. Uh, they, they were forced into, into employment because poverty made it necessary for the Alcotts uh, to go to work at a fairly early age. They worked as teachers, seamstresses, governess, domestic helper, and writers. And that those are all jobs that Louisa May Alcott had during her life, during her early life and late life. Obviously, the one that really stuck was a writer. Her sisters also worked as seamstresses primarily, and their mother worked um, she did social work, what we would consider today to be social work among the Irish immigrants in the area. And that is a picture of Louisa May, Louisa May Alcott's mother, Abigail Alcott, right there.
So Little Women. This is the most well-known book of Louisa May Alcott, even though she wrote extensively. She wrote lots of novels, lots of short stories. Um, just she, she wrote a whole, whole lot. But the most well-known, the most uh, still well-recepted, it has been made into movies and TV shows, and it just continues to be a, a beacon of popular culture even to today, is I think her, in my opinion, her, her best and definitely most influential work. And like I've been saying and pointing out throughout these different slides, it is semi-autobiographical. It's not a complete retelling of her life, but there are lots of parallels between her and her sisters, which we will get to in just a moment, and you'll see how, how it gets even closer and closer. I, I've heard a quote um, from many different places, so I can't necessarily attribute it to anyone, but a good writer writes about what they know, and this is definitely what Louise May Alcott was doing here. She was writing about the struggles that she and her sisters have faced during the American Civil War and during her time just growing up in America. Um, and, and she wrote it down and thought maybe other people will, will like to hear about this too. Um, an interesting part about Little Women is that it was actually published in two parts and then it was put together later. So part one is was called Little Women, or Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, which was published in 1868, right after the American Civil War ended in 1865. And of course, Meg, jo uh, Meg Joe, Beth, and Amy are all characters in the book Little Women. Those are the four little women that we see here pictured um, illustration as well as in the book. And then part two was published Oh, sorry, let me go back to that. Sorry. You're good. Here we go. All right. So part two was published in 1869, so almost a whole year later. And that one was called Good Wives, and it talks about these little women as they have grown up. And they become wives. Some of them become mothers. Uh, and how that is um, reflective of their childhood and upbringing, as well as the society that they are in post-Civil War. And to afterward, it is published together as Little Women. Now, I, I don't have much about the, I don't have a whole slide dedicated to the movie, so I'll throw this in here. An interesting part um, of a lot of the different film adaptations, the 1994 version very much goes by the book, and it starts with part one, and then it goes to part two. So it's very much timeline sequence. If you watch the 2019 version, um, a woman, as I was going out of the movie theater, was like, it jumped around all so much and I was confused. And, which is a f fair review, uh, it did jump around a lot. It jumped between part two and part one. And Greta Gerwig, who directed Little Women, uh, the 2019 version, she, she also wrote it, the, the screenplay for it, she decided uh, to overlap the two parts, so part one and part two because she saw that the reflection of part one and part two very much mirrored each other and each chapter was kind of the continuation of that story. So if you think about the 2019 version, not being an adaptation of the book, but a remake, a retelling, if you will, because it goes through each chapter uh, of part one and part two at the same time. So you have like a lot of little mini stories, which I just think is a, an interesting take on that um, and also explains why it does kind of jump around a bit. So Anne Alcott Pratt. This is the eldest sister of Louise May Alcott. She is the oldest of the four Alcott sisters. Her name is, was Anna Bronson Alcott Pratt. She married uh, a man named John Bridge Pratt. She's the eldest Alcott sister, and she is the basis for the character Margaret or Meg. She was uh, 29 years old on May 23rd, 1860, when she married John Bridge Pratt, and Louisa May Alcott wrote in her journal, I mourn the loss of my nan and I'm not comforted. So this is really very similar to how Jo feels when Meg gets married. She feels the loss of, of sisterhood as Anne or Meg is going off to live with her new family, another man, they're creating their own family. So 
lots and lots of parallels. I see this scene, especially with this quote from Louise May Alcott's diary as being very much a direct reflection into her work, Little Women, about how she feels about her sisters, the sisterly love, the sisterly bond, and also marriage at the time. So of course you also have Louisa May Alcott. She really is the basis for the character Jo, because she's a writer, she's a tomboy, she is unlikely to wed, and she's always taking care of her family. She really shoulders this responsibility of feeling like she needs to, in essence, be, be the man of the house because uh, she had, um, the family had a fond relationship with, with each other but the, and, and loved each other, but that doesn't mean that it's not without its troubles and trials. Um, and her and her father seem to have had a more precarious relationship at times because he was not always able to provide for his family. It is thought that he perhaps suffered from alcoholism. So it's, but they were forced to go to work as women of this time period, which is rather not obviously not unheard of, but it's not something that would be the the overall goal of a, a woman trying to be what you would call a lady. So uh, there was um, probably definitely some tension there, I would assume, and it seems to be. So we have really, I I, I think it's very, very fairly plain that Louisa May Alcott really shows a lot of herself in the character of Joe. One of the things, um, Joe seems very unlikely to marry the entire time. She falls in love with the neighbor, Lori, but then decides that they, she doesn't really want to get married, that she doesn't want to be someone's wife, that she'd rather just be friends. Um, Louisa May Alcott, it seems like she had fallen in love with um, a man when she was on a trip, I think to Europe, uh, but it didn't really go anywhere. It was just kind of a a romantic adventure and then she went home. So of course the one very large difference is that Joe does get married at the end. Louisa May Alcott stays single her entire life. So here we have Elizabeth Seawall or Lizzie Alcott. So Elizabeth um, she is the basis for the character Beth and this is the most direct I think, name that we see. The other one was Anne that became Meg. We have Louisa May who became Josephine March, which is, I think she decided that she really liked the name Josephine and thought that would be fun to, to name her, the character most modeled after her. But here, Elizabeth and having Beth, it, it's, it's a direct translation if you, if you ask me. Uh, in 1856, Lizzie contracted scarlet fever while helping a poor German family, which is exactly what happened to the character Beth in Little Women. And although she recovered, she was permanently weakened and died at the age of 22, which is exactly what happened to the character of Beth. Uh, from what I've read, what, I, what I've seen, um, and, and what I've heard from other historians is that we, we think that Louisa May Alcott was really immortalizing her sister who had died at the time of the publication and writing already, that she was really memorial, memorializing Elizabeth and really preserving her sister's spirit in this character that would then always be with them in the, in the book and the story. Of course, there is also the great sense of, of Every, they all adored Beth, this, this shy, sweet girl who just loved her family. Um, and then, of course, in part two where she's missing and they miss her and trying to go through that loss and grief, which of course was not an uncommon experience in 19th century America where you have the great loss of life due to the American Civil War and also due to large amounts of diseases like scarlet fever. Now, Abigail May Alcott, I believe that is, it's, I think it's French, so I'm going to try to pronounce it, Necater. That's what we're going to go with. So, she was an artist and the youngest of the Alcott sisters. And she went by May. So, we have 
Abigail May, we have Louisa May. The mother's name was also Abigail, so I think to avoid confusion, she went by May, and also she apparently, according to to family story and, and diary entries and such, she just, in her early 20s, declared that she wanted to be called May. So they did. So then she was called May. And she is the basis for the character Amy, which has all the same letters as the name Meg. It's really just scrambled May is Amy. So I, I see a very clear connection between this one as well. And also being an artist of going to Europe, she was the only sister able to attend public school, which is very much like the character Amy in Little Women. She's the youngest and kind of gets what she wants. She's, she's the baby of the family. And Louisa May also actually helped financially support her trips to her her trip to Europe to where she could become a painter and study to become a painter. Amy and sorry, <laughs> May and Louisa May had a very close relationship, a very close sisterly relationship. But Louisa seems to be very much at times very jealous of May because she seemed to always get what she wants to get what she needed. She didn't necessarily sacrifice what she wanted for the family. She took what she wanted and she didn't apologize for it. She was very much um, looking out for her own interests. And I think that that's something that very much the character of Joe and the character of Amy also have those, those problems that... Uh, Joe feels like she has to sit there and provide for the family and, and put her nose to the grindstone and work really hard. And Amy somehow seems to float through life, getting what she wants and being able to just do everything that she wants. So there is tension definitely about that in the book. And there's also tension about that in real life from what we can tell. Now, an interesting part that does not make its way into the book, the semi-autographical book, is that, uh, probably because it happened after the book was published, um, definitely because after the book was published, but on November 8th, 17, 1879 in Paris, May gave birth to a daughter who she named Louisa May, which I think is very much a direct correlation and shows just how close these sisters were. Um, that May is going to name her child after Louisa, and they called her Lulu. But seven weeks after Mary died, oh, sorry, May died, uh, possibly of childbed fever. So by her wish, what this is what May wanted, and because her husband, who was also a French, um, she, they, uh, she had uh, married a man named Ernest, Ernest in France. They were living in France together as man and wife. and But he traveled a lot for his work. So May didn't think that he would be able to take care of the child and to work. So Louisa May ended up living with Louisa May. And Louisa May Alcott brought up Lulu until her death in 1788, so about the time when Lulu herself turned eight, and then she went back to, to France to live with her father. So A.M. Bernard, also Louisa May Alcott. She wrote under a pen name when she wrote more sensational stories like Behind a Mask or A Woman's Power. Uh, there are three, uh, at least, that we know of. We have these more sensational stories that were published, short stories more, that are published in magazines or other types of periodical print. And that is, of course, Behind a Mask or a Woman's Power, The Abbot's Ghost or Maurice Terhen's Temptation, or A Long Fatal Love Chase. So this is also something that we very much see in the book Little Women when Jo goes and she's, and she's in New York. She's trying to make a quick buck and she starts writing these more sensational stories published under no name anonymously or under a pen name. Very much like Louise May Alcott herself did. 
So abolition, the, they were transcendentalists, they were abolitionists, they were against the practice of slavery. And in 1847, Louisa May Alcott and her family served as a station as a, and station masters on the Underground Railroad. And they housed a fugitive slave for at least one week. And they also had discussions with the incredibly well-known former enslaved person and abolitionist, as well as an uh, advocate for women's rights, Frederick Douglass. So Louisa May Alcott, we always think of her as this great writer, but she was also in such a incredibly interesting social scene for also not really being a person of privilege. She, they, they were poor. She was a poor woman in the 1860s and somehow she still was able to uh, rub elbows with these really, really famous people today, like uh, Henry David Thoreau and Frederick Douglass, and they seem to have friendships with these people, and uh, I just find it incredibly interesting, and how that had to make, these conversations that she had with these people had to make their way into some of her writings. She was also very much a feminist. She became the first woman to register to vote in Concord, Massachusetts in a school board election. And also she never married because she felt at the time a woman had to give up a lot of her rights to become to become married. Uh, of course, if you were hopefully in a marriage of, of equals that, uh, you, you know, you would be treated well and in a loving relationship, but if you weren't and your husband was abusive or didn't manage money well, uh, all of your money was his money once you became married, all of your property became his property once you were married, the children were not, you didn't have any legal resources to, um, over any of your children. So she, I believe, is basically stated as saying, I love my liberty too much to become someone's husband or to become to take a husband and become someone's wife so she she never married she really valued her own personal independence she i i think she ended up uh living with her parents until their deaths uh at or orchard house there is where she wrote little women and her father actually built her at her own desk for for her writing which it shows that her parents were also very invested in in her writing career and wanted to help her pursue that by building her this desk. They also let May draw on the walls uh, to encourage her artistic abilities. Uh, so if you go to Orchard House, you can see paintings that May did that are still left on the walls, which I just think is very interesting to see how they supported their children's interests. So novels, she wrote <laughs> a lot of novels, uh, some of those being uh, listed here. So her first book was called Flower Fables, which was published in 1849. And it's a selection of tales originally written for Ellen Emerson, who was the daughter of Ralph Waldo Emerson, another transcendentalist who is also a very famous writer that the Alcott were friends with. She wrote Moods, which was published in 1865, but then was revised in 1882. She also wrote The Mysterious Key and What It Opened in 1867. Uh, so right after The Mysterious Key and What It Opened, that's when Little Women would have been written and it was published in 1868. And then the part two of Little Women, Good Wives, was published in 1869. So that's where that fits in on this timeline here. And then she wrote in 1870, An Old Fashioned Girl, which we have a picture of right here about uh, a country girl who goes to the city to live, I believe, with her aunt and uncle. And she's very much surprised about how this rich family treats each other they don't have much care and affection and then she teaches them to love each other basically is old-fashioned girl in a nutshell as we do here at the history center 
And then we also have Will's Wonder Book, which was published in 1870. And when I look at the dates, especially starting after the American Civil War, she wrote a novel almost every single year. That is incredible. Novels continued because she wrote even more. Uh, she wrote Work, which is a story of experience in 1873, of course. Um, she was a woman who had to work in the, in the 19th century, which is definitely an experience. She also wrote Beginning Again, being a continuation of work, so basically part two, in 1875. She wrote Eight Cousins, or The Ant Hill, in 1875 as well. She also wrote Rose and Bloom, a sequel to Eight Cousins, in 1870, 1876. She wrote Under the Lilacs, in 1878, and Jack and Jill, a village story, in 1880. Um, from what I can tell and what I have personally known, it seems that Little Woman is definitely her most popular book. And then from the ones that I've just listed, I have heard most about um, An Old Fashioned Girl and Eight Cousins. Those seem to be the ones that are still in print if you go to the classic sections of a bookstore, that you can still find those more popular than some of her other works as well. But of course, that's not all. There's even more. <laughs> There's Little Women is not just a novel in two parts, but it's also a series. It did so well. And people were so interested to see what happened to the March sisters and to Joe and her school that she was going to open for boys that she wrote Little Men, the sequel to Little Women, or also called A Life at Plumfield with Joe's Boys. And this is about Joe being a school teacher, excuse me, being a school teacher and um, uh, her, her adventure with, with her school boys. And then we have Joe's Boys and How They Turned Out, a sequel to Little Men in 1886. I'm just incredibly impressed by the amount, the sheer amount of writing that this woman did. And these are just, I don't think this is even a complete list of all of her novels that we just went through. She also wrote short stories and sketches and collections of short stories. So, so much writing. There's just so much writing that she did. It just honestly impresses me with the sheer amount. Uh, so here are some of our resources that we used for today's presentations. Uh, Louisa May Alcott Orchard House, um, museum with digital programs, which absolutely look amazing. Uh, www.louisamayalcott.org. We also wrote a uh, the, the book, uh, Louisa May Alcott, Her Life, Letters, and Journals, which are available on Project Gutenberg at www.gutenberg.org. All right. Thank you so much, Marie. Absolutely. That's fascinating. And, and everybody in the chat, uh, this is Libba from Behind the Scenes. You probably guessed <laughs> Hi, that Libba. if you're a returning viewer. Uh, we're going to take your questions now. Um, but uh, I wanted to start the conversation oh, off yeah. because we actually uh, read Little Women, the series. We did. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can actually see uh, me <laughs> reading Little Women. And yes. uh, I really, really enjoyed this. It was such a great look into the daily life of, like you said, um, an ordinary family mm -hmm. in the 1860s. And, um, you know, when, when you talk about Louisa May Alcott's uh, more autobiographical parts of the story, mm -hmm. Was there anything in your research that really surprised you? Any connections that you you made um, that you you were not expecting? Um, so I mean, I've I've been a Little Women fan for a very long time. So it, I, it wasn't all when I was just researching for this presentation. But I think when I found out about Beth and just how similar the character of Beth and even the the name Beth is so close to the experiences and it, it to me it almost is, is the exact same same character as the person um beth and elizabeth to where i that kind of surprised me because everyone else was like oh well they're they're kind of based on the character they're kind of based on the sister but with beth i was like no like this that's just beth it seems like that that's just that's exactly what happened 
So I thought that, especially for she's, I think she's also one of the sisters that I grew up identifying more with. So I, I always very much liked that character. And just to see how similar that the real person of Elizabeth was to the character of Beth kind of surprised me because I was like, oh, well, it's usually just, you know, it's just kind of loosely based on her life. And then Beth is just like, no, this is like almost direct um, pen to paper to life adaptation of this character slash person. So I think that one surprised me a little bit more with just how close those were. Of course, I'm sure that there were some liberties taken for the sake of the story where it was not, you know, 100% what what happened with, with Beth. But I think it's, that, that part just surprised me because it was just so, so close. Now, something that um, I didn't realize until uh, you mentioned it mm -hmm. was that Joe, excuse me, <laughs> I was... I know, I keep doing I know, it too. <laughs> I, know, I keep getting all these characters mixed up, but... You were saying that Louisa May Alcott didn't have a very healthy relationship with her father uh, in real life, yet mm -hmm. in her novels, they the sisters have a very close and loving mm -hmm. relationship with their father, and the father figure is depicted as a as a very you know healthy, responsible mm -hmm. uh, man fighting for his country. Mm -hmm. Do you? It seems like it it makes sense that she would make that character absent yet still loving and likable and mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on how she portrayed that relationship in particular hmm i think because while it was troubled i think it was still loving so to wipe away perhaps some of the more troubling aspects with him just being absent for the first part um, and to still keep the loving aspects, I think that might have been what happened for some of that. Of course, it's semi-autobiographical, so I think there are more liberties taken with that character, which perhaps shows like the, the troubled nature that she didn't want to put that all into the semi-autobiographical book, uh, because it's the book is about the little women, not about the father. So I think to include those struggles, it might have taken attention away from the girls, um, but there is definitely some jabs at the father, I would say, but most of them come from Aunt March. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, and, and that's an interesting character to bring up as well. Yes. Are there connections to this this figure of Aunt March <laughs> being this very matronly, old-fashioned <laughs> relative? Um, are, were there any Aunt Marches in Louisa May Alcott's real life? Not that I could find. That, that's not to say that there aren't any, but uh, when I was putting together this presentation, none jumped out at me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, David is wondering, uh, just how many novels did uh, Alcott write? I, I know that you I listed... honestly don't have a number off the top of my head. I was keeping count in the in the slides after he uh, posted that question, and it, it looks like we've got at least 12. So, mm -hmm. And you mentioned she also has many short stories mm -hmm. as well. Now, uh, her family, it also seems that she had a very creative and uh, artistic family. Yes. <laughs> were, were there other um, uh, mediums of art or writing, uh, other connections to that sort of creative mind in, her fa in the rest of her family? Uh, it seems like she herself being very much a writer and May, her youngest sister being the artist, were really the two most prominent creative souls out there, which also might have led to their more jealousy and butting heads than some of the other sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, Arissa says uh, that's that's so true regarding the relationship with the father. It's about the girls, not the father. Mm -hmm. And and that's a good point because even even the mother character, while very loving and definitely present in, mm -hmm. in the book, it really does central uh, or revolve around the girls' experiences mm -hmm. themselves. Now, um, thinking about the, the historical context mm -hmm. of Little Women, um, I know that this was written around the Civil War or during the Civil War, or did it take... I, I know you just mentioned that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the first part of Little Women definitely takes place during the American Civil War. The second part takes place during what we would call Reconstruction. Uh, of course, the South didn't have to be physically reconstructed as much as the South did. But, or the North, yeah. Or I'm sorry, as, as, as the North did. But... Uh, 
the, it was written when I would be considered right after slash during the American Civil War. I don't have exact dates of when she put pen to paper to start writing all of this down. Uh, sometimes writers, they, they write over a long period of time. Sometimes they just sit down and they hash it all out. I'm not necessarily sure if we have documentation of what her writing style is, or if we do, I am not necessarily aware of it. But it was definitely written right after slash during the American Civil War, because it was published in 1868, and the American Civil War ended in 1865. So no, just seeing about how fast she writes, I would consider she's a fast writer. Uh, I would consider that she wrote this after the American Civil War set during it. And, I mean, since it, it does revolve around the Civil War, yet the book itself doesn't seem to have any definitive, you know, points of view other than the father is fighting for the Union. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also the character of Hannah. They're, um, I guess, their maid, their cook. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk to us about that character and how the, the uh, family treats Hannah? So, um, in, in the movie slash book, the not real life Little Women, but uh, the the story, it seems like Hannah is still she she I think she's an Irish immigrant. Uh, is that correct? You know, I, I I had the idea that she was African American, but you may you may be right. I. Let me, let me look We're that up. We're going to look really that up. <laughs> um, but that's interesting. That seems like if she is an Irish immigrant, then that would be a good connection since um, you had mentioned that her mother mm -hmm. had worked with Irish immigrants yes. during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is interesting that the family is depicted as having a, a maid since it seems like the Alcott family were indeed probably too poor to afford one. You are correct. It, she is of Irish descent mm -hmm. uh, and also mentions very dear to the family. She's treated more like a member of the family mm -hmm. uh, than a servant. Uh, it also brings to mind, you know, you mentioned that they're on the poor end, yet they do have some some help. Mm -hmm. I mean, could we kind of see her as lower middle class of this era? I think, I'm not sure necessarily what I would consider the the actual Alcott's, but I think Little Women is very much depicted as... Lower middle class. Lower middle class, yeah. Because they have wealthy relations who aren't going to let them slip too far into poverty. Right. Because otherwise it would look bad for the entire family. Because <laughs> you have the Aunt March, but they're definitely not on the same social status or uh, income level as Aunt March. But of course, when Aunt March dies, then they get some of the inheritance and it rises their family. Oh, it looks like um, Beth also mentions, uh, Beth did a little research for us and says that uh, it was about 41 books, some were originally written wow. in magazines, uh, like Under the Lilacs. Thank you for sharing that. That, that really is amazing. That's a lot. And Beth books. also mentions she additionally wrote hundreds of short stories, so truly a, pl uh, a prolific writer. Yes. Uh, we also have some comments about your outfit. So oh. could you talk about um, yes. your outfit and how it represents this time period in the social class? Yes, yes. So um, this is what I would consider, if we can go back to the photo of Louisa May Alcott and her sister Anne Prescott. Okay, let's see. So we're going to go to Anne Prescott. Let me get that ready or just for Pratt. us. just Pratt. I'm sorry, not Prescott Pratt. Oh, yeah. Let's see. It's going to take me a second. Not that one. Okay. Anna Pratt? Yes. Yes. Here we go. All right. All go. right. So if you see my outfit here, it is very similar to that of Anne Prescott. And if, sorry, I keep calling her Prescott. It's not Prescott. It's Pratt. Uh, of Anna Pratt. Is this photo I believe was taken uh, based on the hairstyle and the outfit as well as the quality of the photograph. I believe it was taken in the 1850s and that's one style that this dress would have been. It's uh, a very nice versatile dress. It's mine is, mine is made out of cotton, uh, a nice lavender cotton. And then it's uh, it's an interesting one because it has more of an open front in the middle that you would then put a chemisette or a scarf uh, like thing here, which would sometimes be held closed with a pin that we can see that she has there. Uh, very middle class clothing. Uh, I would consider this, especially looking at hers. She does have some trim. She has a nice two little ribbons going down the side there. I also see that there's some trim on her sleeves and it looks like she has little um, 
a two part sleeve. So there's a, a decorative um, part on her sleeve there before it goes down to the rest of the, the encapsulating sleeve. And also it looks like she has a nice little print to her outfit there too. If I had to guess, um, the character Meg was always slightly more concerned about her looks and having nice clothes and nice things, which I think perhaps that might have come from Anna because just looking at the slight, it's a, it's a very plain dress. It's a very, very middle class dress, but she's dressing it up with little trims and in pins and she's doing her hair in a perhaps a more fashionable hairstyle. Uh, it's the 50s, so it's about width. <laughs> it's a lot about width as you have um, the center part and then the 1860s it kind of morphed it was still about width but then it morphed into coming up higher uh until you had the 1870s where it was all all up top <laughs> now if we could go to the photo of louisa may that was okay. right after this one let's if see. that's possible yes yes absolutely let's see okay so after this one yes so we have Louisa May. Is this the correct one? Uh, let me find... No, it's the one where we can, uh, where we say that she's like Joe. Okay, okay, let's see here. Because she's wearing also a very similar style dress, but now I want to analyze her dress as well. Oh, here we go. All right. This one. So here we have Louisa May. She also has very much the same style of dress like this one, but it was probably taken in the 1850s. I think this is, this is interesting because she also has the width of the hairstyle, but she had little ringlets coming down. So maybe she cared a little bit more about how she looked than she lets on being her tomboy self. Uh, she also has uh, a chemisette or a, or a scarf, a fichu perhaps. Um, those are very much older style types of dresses. A lot of times I see in photographs, ladies who are a bit older wearing this. It's a bit of a more matronly style. It's not necessarily the most fashionable of styles to be wearing during the 1850s, but it's not um, looked down upon either. Uh, I think it's just, and, and it, also you can look at this one. She just has, it looks to be plain black. She doesn't have any trim or a little anything going on. Uh, it's too uh, chopped off to see if she has a pin or a brooch um, holding together. I'm just going to call it a chemisette for, for terms, but more plain, definitely more plain than her sisters who had very much the same style with the uh, more 1850s look. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Marie, for oh, that absolutely. awesome presentation. Uh, Mary uh, on Facebook said, well done. Your passion for little women is contagious. <laughs> it's a <laughs> good story. It really is. It really is. And y'all, if you would like to listen along to our classic tales series mm -hmm. where I read uh, little women, I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Um, so I've got that on YouTube chat now, mm -hmm. and then you'll also see it on Facebook. Also, want to uh, thank our uh, donors today. Thank yes, you so thank much. Yes, thank you so much. That was wonderful. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, David and History Girls, thank you so much. Yes. And uh, even if you did not donate, we, have, we so appreciate your support by just yes. viewing. And we have lots of awesome programs coming up, so be sure to check out our live stream schedule uh, that's on our Facebook page. Be sure to subscribe if you're mm -hmm. not already subscribing yes. and following us. <laughs> and we also have digital memberships where we, we really dive into niche topics. And, Much more niche. Oh yes, and this Friday you could have a virtual tour of our Ooh. 18th century cabin that is here on site at the mm -hmm. History Center. And you can become a member by going to the link I am going to type. <laughs> that is just going to our website um, in E g-a-h-c dot o-r-g slash member to become a member for as little as three dollars a month or 35 a year it really helps us and it's a great deal <laughs> so yes so thank you all uh, for joining us thank you marie and absolutely i had a wonderful time all right take care bye